To see one reason Ukraine is doing better than expected, have a close-up look at just one weapon its military has deployed. The Turkish Bayraktar TB2 drones. NATO has previously used these drones to great effect against Russian-backed forces in Syria. The Ukrainians bought dozens of them and have reportedly been using them against Russian military vehicles. Ukraine is being very secretive about the exact number of drones they have. Former Ukrainian Defense Minister Andriy Zagorodnyuk is in Kyiv. I cannot say how many because they are still uh, still being supplied. And obviously during the wartime, armed forces are not disclosing the exact numbers, never. It has a very substantial charge, so it pretty much can destroy any equipment which Russians have. Western countries have provided the Ukrainian forces with hundreds of Stinger and other anti-aircraft missiles. Those missiles have been very effective against Russian helicopters like this one and other low-flying aircraft. They are less effective against high-flying Russian fighter jets, but some of those have been brought down as well. Ukrainians have also used Western-supplied Javelin and other anti-tank missiles to target Russian armored vehicles. Many Russian tanks get stuck in the mud when they try to get off roadways to escape being hit. All of that has slowed the Russian advance and Putin's plan to quickly take Ukraine's cities and decapitate the government. That might not all be good news, according to retired Canadian General Lewis McKenzie. There's a downside to that. There's a saying in the Russian military, never send a soldier where an artillery round can go first. Fools! And they'll start using their heavy artillery, their rocket launchers, their missiles, and they will devastate locations where there's some resistance. Russian artillery strikes are now killing thousands of Ukrainians, shelling apartment buildings hospitals, and schools. As civilian casualties pile up, public pressure increases on leaders of NATO countries to do something to stop it. Retired American General Philip Breedlove was a NATO Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. How long will the West watch Ukraine fight alone if we continue to have hospitals bombed out and people crushed in them? And I think that's the question. Rick Hillier was Canada's top general as chief of defense staff. NATO does have an overwhelming capability and they could stop the Russian uh, steamroller that's moving into the Ukraine. As civilians are slaughtered in the cities of Ukraine, the Zelensky government has pleaded with NATO countries to establish a no-fly zone over the entire country. NATO countries have refused to do that because it could lead to a direct confrontation with Russian aircraft and potentially World War III. We're not interested in a shooting war with Russia. Nobody wants to go there. Uh, but if we say, hey, we're going to protect all those refugees that are heading west, all those desperate people, I think we could do a protection, a no-fly zone over those humanitarian routes and help them get out of Ukraine. If we're just going to stand by and, and, and let this kind of a disaster unfold, it surely does not speak well of us in the West. I've changed my mind uh, over the last week or so that uh, the way this thing is turning out, this conflict is turning out, then yes, no, no fly zone. I would endorse a no fly zone. Like John McCain said when he defined a no fly zone, if you fly, you die. So that means anybody we encounter, we, the good guys, encounter, they're going to be shot down. The principal objection to increased NATO involvement is the possibility of nuclear war. Putin has ordered his nuclear forces onto high alert, and Russian military doctrine has long envisioned the use of nuclear weapons. The message I think Mr. Putin is trying to send is he understands that he can never stand against a fully generated NATO. And so he wants everybody to understand that, you know, if we start losing, we will use nukes. Faced with Putin's nuclear threats, there is a surprising consensus among senior generals we consulted that NATO should call his bluff. It's not a threat. We have to back off 
as a result of not doing the right thing because we believe the threat. That's just caving in and it's going to happen every time in the next country that he might want to occupy. Putin wants one thing out of this. He wants to succeed, but more importantly, he wants to survive. And so if he knows that if he throws a nuke somewhere, even a tactical nuke, if there is such a thing, uh, he's going to have a tough problem surviving, and that's not what he's going to want to do. And you can't keep using that threat to the West. There is growing support for NATO to stand up to Putin now because the Russian leader has made clear in his published demands that he is already looking beyond Ukraine to his next intended targets. Ukraine is an important goal, and we need to be focused on the suffering of the Ukrainian people. But if you read those documents, Mr. Putin's eyes are set on rewriting the security architecture of Eastern Europe. Essentially, he wants to rebuild the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union. In anticipation of a war that could spread to other countries, this pro-Putin military analyst appeared on Russian TV in the days leading up to the Ukrainian invasion. He insisted that Russia could attack the Baltic states and easily wipe out the NATO forces there. He specifically mentioned the Canadian troops now assigned to the defense of Latvia. In recent days, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau visited Latvia and announced the extension of Canada's military mission there. Well, thank you so much for being here. But like all NATO leaders, he remains opposed to a no-fly zone over Ukraine. The public reaction seems less cautious. A recent poll showed 74% of Americans now support a no-fly zone. What did we say after the Holocaust? Never again. What did we say after Srebrenica and other places? In two years, hopefully in two years, this has come to some resolution, and we look back in what we did. Will we say again, never again, and lament our action? As Russia steps up its attacks on civilians, even shelling apartment blocks with tank fire, the question is whether increasing public pressure in the West will lead to more NATO involvement. Terence McKenna, CBC News, Toronto.